welcome back to my od and campaign. Before I get into this episode, I just want to take a few moments to talk about od and combat. Figuring out how to conduct it in accordance with the rules is tricky, and as I progress through this campaign, hopefully through trial and error, I will begin to clarify things. The real challenge in doing so is that there are four systems involved. Firstly, a full understanding of the chainmail turn sequence is needed. Secondly, a full understanding of how the man-to-man combat rules supersede this is needed. And thirdly, a full understanding of how the alternative combat system then supersedes the previous two rules. Until I have finished wrestling with these three things, until I find a way to perfectly harmonise them, I keep finding new scenarios that contradict my previous understanding. I hope you will bear with me, as the ultimate goal is to get to the bottom of it, so each episode is a further learning curve. If you stay along for the ride though, then we can unravel the mysteries of od and together. If you enjoy my content, would like to send a small donation to show your appreciation and help support this channel so it can continue to grow and expand, then please visit paypal.me forward slash Tom D and D. That said, let's get into the adventure. The characters search the room, which takes the rest of the turn. They trace the sickly, sweet smell of smoke to a small cauldron in the centre of a hearth on the eastern wall. Inside the cauldron is what appears to be a pile of dead frogs being smoked in the fireplace, amongst peculiar petals and other strange plants and herbs. Despite the pungent smell, the characters feel somewhat replenished by the smoky air. Lunis and Varley regain a hit point. As Yazelda is undamaged, she does not. There is a peculiar note pinned above the hearth which reads, Two of your friends are dead, and you couldn't find the prisoner. You were always a poor student, Lunis. The note is signed, Ganrin. The characters retrieve as much of the treasure as they can carry, which isn't much. They abandon the copper pieces altogether and focus on the silver. Distributing the treasure will take the rest of the current turn. The characters are not interrupted by any wandering monsters. After sorting the treasure, the character's speed is reduced to armoured foot movement which means they can only move 60 feet every half turn. They take the stone stairway up, and as they do, there is a harmonious resonance in the air, which is somehow soothing. They feel the weariness drain from their bones. The party will now be able to continue a whole hour without needing a rest. This is six turns of game time. The stairway continues for some time, twisting and turning frantically through narrow passages up and up and sometimes down until eventually after about a turn they emerge into a semicircle shaped room directly behind them is a tall narrow window which overlooks part of the island in which the tower is situated the bright evening sun still blazes in the sky above directly in front is a large green door. A few drops of water drip onto the characters, and then, without much more warning, rain begins to pour. The characters look up at the ceiling which towers above them, which seems perfectly intact. However, it is quite clearly raining indoors. There is a flash of light followed by a crack of thunder, and at the top of the stairs, about 20 feet away, someone appears. A dark-haired woman wearing a long yellow robe with loose sleeves embroidered of a pointed hexagon sitting against a checkered square. The characters know this symbol well. This woman is an Oadan magic user from Terusia. 
This is the same order of wizards which oppresses the Terusian minorities and dictate their laws of magic, banning any demi-human from using it. The magic user wears an angular violet helm, carries a wand and wears a heavy silver ring. The party has never seen this particular magic user before. The woman appears to recognise the confusion registering on the party's faces, and with a smug smile she speaks. There are many things you do not understand about this place, she says, and you will be dead before you ever know. Suddenly, a jar appears in the magic user's hand containing a small swarm of locusts. The magic user is going to attempt to open the jar. Initiative rolls. Party 5. Magic user 2. As all combatants are within 30 feet of each other, melee combat will occur. The party has the initiative. Each member of the party can make an attack on the magic user before she can open the jar of locusts. Only a 10 is needed to hit this magic user. Although magic users are very weak in melee due to their lack of armour, they are very powerful foes when they have opportunities to use their magic. Two hits, the magic user is level one, so she has one hit die. She has four hit points, rolling 2d6 damage. 10 damage. The party easily rushes the magic user and runs her through before she can open the jar. However, the jar is now hurtling towards the ground as the magic user falls. Each character has a 1 in 3 chance of catching it before it hits the ground. Yazelda and Lunis will suffer a minus 1 penalty to their roll due to their low dexterity score. None of them make the required roll. The glass smashes into the floor and the locusts begin a frenzy. I will roll a die to determine who the locusts will attack. Die 1, Yazalda. 2, Lunis. 3, Vali. 4, the magic user. It's a 4. The locusts begin to ravage the dead magic user, making short work of the flesh. This gives the characters a chance to escape. The characters try to force the door, but it won't budge. They notice a large keyhole to the right. The only key in the party's possession is the bronze key carried by Yazelda. She tries it in the door, and with a click, it unlocks. The characters push against the door and rush through and close and lock the door behind them. They are relieved to find themselves back in the tower's entrance hall, with the front door still held open by an iron spike. The party rushes outside. However, they are too encumbered to easily climb down the stairs, which have several dangerous halls where they have collapsed. They douse their lanterns, which are no longer necessary, and come up with the following plan to traverse the treacherous gaps in the stairs leading down the outside of the tower. The characters are faced with two gaps to traverse, one of which must be climbed down and another jumped across. They will hammer several iron spikes in the ground at the top of the stairs with the rock, secure rope tightly, and have one character hold the rope secure while another descends and secures further spikes into the sheer rock face periodically on the way down, so that the other characters can follow them down one by one, using the spikes as a climbing aid. If a spike fails, the rope will provide further safety. If all spikes securing the rope at the top of the stairs fail, the character holding the rope secure will provide further safety. The character descended will have the rope tied around their waist to catch them if they slip. The heavy luggage, such as sacks of coins and backpacks, will be fed down with the rope, and then the last character will climb down to join the others at the bottom. 
the second gap will easily be jumped across by any character as it is a lot more trivial while descending as the upper steps are above the gap. The characters will have to toss heavy sacks across the gap first though. I will rule that all this activity will use up all your Zelda's iron spikes and the characters will not have time to retrieve them due to the urgency of the matter. The party will also have to leave the rope behind as well. I will also rule that fully descending the stairs will take at least a turn to discuss, at least two turns for each character to climb and then jump to safety, plus a further 1d4 turns to take into account trial and error. It will take five turns in total to get each character to the bottom of the stairs, but there is a one in six chance at the end of each turn that a locust swarm will appear. After four turns, a locust swarm appears. Two of the characters made it to the bottom of the stairs and one is still yet to come down. I will roll to determine who. It's Varley. I will roll a d4 to determine her location on the stairs. Die 1, she's still at the top. 2, she is mid-descent of the first gap. 3, she's between the first and second gap. 4, she has traversed the second gap. Varley is between the first and second gap. The swarm approaches from the east. There is no surprise. The characters see the swarm from 20 feet away. It is flying over the stairs between Varley and the other characters. Initiative rolls. Party 4, Locust Swarm 1. As the swarm is within 20 feet, there is no chance of evasion. The characters will need to stand their ground. As the swarm is within melee range, melee combat will take place. The party won the initiative, so will act first. Lunis will douse a nearby briar growing through the cracks in the stone stairs with oil from his remaining flask. Yazelda will attempt to ignite it by lighting and throwing her lamp at the briar. She's 20 feet away from it, so I will treat the lantern as a handheld weapon which in OD&D is treated as a short bow for hit probability. I previously explained that missiles cannot be fired into melee. This rule is given in chainmail. However, there is some general confusion. If two figures are said to be within melee range at 30 feet, or 3 inches, then this would imply missile fire is not allowed. That was my previous interpretation. However, this cannot be the case, as Chainmail also explains that ranges for each weapon are divided into thirds, with short range between 0 to 50 feet. So how can a missile weapon be fired at less than 30 feet if it's not allowed in melee? This needs to be cleared up before the game can continue. This sort of situation is exactly what I was referring to when I said the rules have to be wrestled with. I think the rational answer as to whether a character can fire a missile weapon would be dictated by whether the line of fire is blocked by melee. In principle, I think this would work and would appear to be the author's intention. It would also seem logical that characters can move while in melee distance. However, blows will be struck as indicated in the man-to-man -man combat system presented in Chainmail. So taking all this into account, let's see how this encounter will play out. Yazalda throws her lamp at the briar, which I will treat as armor class 9, which will be reduced to armor class 11 for short range. However, Yazalda has a minus 1 penalty to missile fire, therefore she will need to score a 9 on the d20 to hit successfully. 17 hits, the briar bursts into flames, creating a thick pillar of smoke, as the midpoint of the move is used for range determination, according to Chainmail. It can be assumed 
did the locust swarm has cut half of the distance down towards the party. The swarm enters the pillar of smoke and is immediately scattered. The characters sigh with relief as the swarm disperses and retreats. Stay tuned to find out what happens next. If you enjoyed this episode, then please give this video a like. Feel free to add a comment to let me know your thoughts. If you don't want to miss a future video, then make sure you subscribe and click the bell icon to receive a notification when I upload a new one. See you next session.